Yeah, please go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Jane. Thank you to the group for inviting me. It's a uh, great pleasure to be here this morning. So I'm planning to tell you a little bit specifically about topological order in two contexts, in quantum and classical physics, and a little bit about what that means in terms of emergence. So by the end of this hour, what, where I hope to have got to is to have told you a bit about a candidate case of emergence from classical physics, so the physics of polymers. And what that does is build on some previous work on um, a case from sort of the other end of condensed matter physics, the very quantum mechanical end, and that's the fractional quantum Hall effect. And what links these both together is the notion of topological order. And so not only is there an intriguing mathematical correspondence between this very classical and very uh, quantum mechanical piece of physics, which has lots of um, possible properties or uh, features that you might think are emergent, I'm going to try and spell out a little bit about how we might understand that, um, the possibility of emergence in those cases. So that's, that's where I hope to get to. Uh, the physics I'm going to talk about is, has a background in quantum field theory, so if you're interested, um, I would recommend a uh, ho-ho, this, this book uh, that I co-wrote several years ago on quantum field theory, so do ask me at the end if you're interested in that one. The more important uh, references are the uh, two papers at the bottom here. So the 2015 paper that was uh, written by Mark Pexton and I is on the fractional quantum Hall effect and emergence. And the later paper led by Tom McLeish, who's now at York University, um, that's on the classical case. So, but I'm gonna tell you a bit about both of those. So the plan then is to start with the uh, review of the fractional quantum Hall effect. And I'm gonna build up quite slowly through what that actually is. And then uh, by analogy, I'm going to introduce this very classical case of um, a very similar system based on polymer rings. And then I'm going to try and tease out what we might think is emergent from those two cases. So that's the plan. So I'm going to start by telling you about the fractional quantum Hall fluid. And that's a two dimensional state of electronic matter that we realize in high magnetic fields. So I'll try and um, spell out exactly what we mean by all of these things. I'm going to call it the fractional quantum Hall fluid and there's lots of scope for confusion here and that's because I'm going to talk about fluids in this first sense of them being a quantum fluid and by fluid in this sense we mean an interacting system of many electrons that you find inside a solid and then in the second part of the talk when I talk about liquids I'll be talking literally about the sorts of things we call fluids so apologies do, do interrupt if, if anything gets too confusing. Okay so Within condensed matter physics, we often talk about emergence, but it's often talked about in terms of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and phase transitions. And so the usual story is given in terms of this cartoon. So what I've drawn on the left here is a picture of a disordered magnet. And roughly speaking, I've drawn as many arrows up as, as there are down. And so if I wave a magnetometer over this um, magnet, I should get the answer zero that there's no overall magnetization because there are as many spins up as there are spins down, roughly speaking. And I can perform a magic trick by taking each of these spins and rotating them through 180 degrees. I get the configuration then shown on the right here. And again, I wave my magnetometer over that configuration and I get zero again. And we call the fact that I get zero for both of these, we call this a symmetry. So this system has has this symmetry that gives me zero magnetization in both cases. So this is the sense in which those magnets are the same. Now, if I cool these magnets down, then um, perhaps they will undergo a transition to long range magnetic order. And one possible configuration that shows magnetic order is shown on the left here. And my magnetometer there will tell me that all of the spins are pointing up. So I get a magnetization in the up direction. But then if I perform the same magic trick, turning all of the spins to 180 degrees, I get the configuration shown on the right here. And I certainly can tell the difference between the um, configuration on the left and the right in that the magnetometer registers magnetization up on the left and down on the right. And so we say that the symmetry has been lowered or broken when this system um, magnetically ordered. So that's the notion of broken symmetry. And it's really the cornerstone of condensed matter physics and the emergence debate in condensed matter physics. And Philip Anderson, in his famous book on condensed matter physics written in the 1980s, spelt out four ways in which we can um, characterize solids based on this notion. Uh, the important ones for our purposes are that as soon as um, uh, symmetry is broken, you get a new sort of order. And you can tell that you have because there's a sort of rigidity. He talks about this in, as in terms of a sort of emergent order that transmits force around. It resists you trying to get rid of the order that's already there. 
So that's one place we might look for emergence. We might also look uh, for it in the fact that there are new sorts of excitations. There are new particles that um, you see in these ordered phases of matter that you don't see otherwise. There are other sorts of objects that are new, uh, things like defects, walls, or um, uh, impurities almost. That they're, they're sort of little regions of disorder that separate different sorts of order in different places. So there's lots of places you might look for emergence and um, for example you know in terms of the in terms of an ordered magnet the rigidity in that case is the permanent magnetism the property that sticks a magnet to your refrigerator the excitations in this case are magnon particles so waves in terms of the spin um, and the defects in this case are domain walls they're, they're walls of spins that separate um, for example all of the spins pointing up on the left and down on the right for example and you can play this game with lots of phases of matter. So you can do it with superfluids and superconductors. So in a superconductor, the rigidity in this case is the supercurrent. There's excitations in terms of new Bogolubov quasi-particles, sometimes called Bogolons. There are defects, which we call vortices. And again, you can, you can spell out lots of ordered phases of matter and you can debate about the emergence in those cases. And that's how we understand most ordered phases of matter, but the fractional quantum Hall fluid isn't like this. So this is a phase of matter that can't be described within this framework. And it's not completely mysterious. We know where it comes from. It must come in some sense from electron-electron interactions. But what I'm going to show you is that its description is based not on symmetry, but actually on topology, the study of the overall shapes of spaces and objects. So in order to understand the fractional quantum Hall effect, I'll just step us through what we mean by Hall effects and just um, go step by step to um, introduce this. So here's the simplest possible experiment you can do within condensed matter. This is passing a current through a piece of, um, piece of matter and you can see the ele electrons flow through it. We then apply a magnetic field out of the plane of this slab and the electrons now feel a new force. This is the Lorentz force. And this is exactly the force that causes electrons to undergo helical motion in a magnetic field. So in the two dimensional plane perpendicular to that field, they undergo so circular cyclotron motion. And we'll keep returning back to that, that sort of motion. So the electrons are forced off to the left where they'll collide with the side of this bar. And what that will do is set up an electric field. And the electric field opposes the force that um, forces them into the side. And what happens then is that um, there's an exact cancellation in the end and the current can flow through the bar. But the side effect from this is that you've got um, electronic charges built up along the left and a paucity of electronic charges along the right and that creates a voltage and that's called the Hall voltage. And so this is a very um, standard piece of condensed matter. It's, it's the foundation of a lot of laboratory work that undergraduates do. And it's not particularly remarkable. It's uh, understood based on classical electrodynamics. It's very, very useful, because you can use it to measure the number of electrons in your piece of matter. Uh, and it's known as the Hall effect. And the most important thing for our purposes is if you plot that new voltage that appears divided by the current as a function of the applied field, you get a straight line. OK, so this is the conventional Hall effect. Now, in around the middle of the 20th century, you were able to do new experiments on the Hall effect. And that's because we could cut, suddenly make materials where electrons were confined very precisely to two dimensions. So we could create electronic gases that were two dimensional. The idea here is if you grow a very pure uh, wide gap semiconductor and then you grow a narrow gap semiconductor on top of it, uh, what happens is the energy bands, that's the allowed energies electrons can have, form a sort of well that traps electrons inside them. And so quantum mechanically, you confine all of your mobile electrons to this um, surface layer, this interface between the two materials. And they can move freely in that plane, um, but they can't move out of the plane. And so you've made a basically perfect um, two-dimensional gas in that case. Now repeat the same experiments and we get a surprise. So if you just look at the um, bottom left-hand corner here, you'll see you get this nice straight line for the, again, the um, Hall voltage divided by the current as a function of field. But you can see at high field, you've got these steps. And we can understand these steps using quantum mechanics. And so this is known as the quantum Hall effect, or more precisely, the integer quantum Hall effect. And the idea is that once you apply a magnetic field, you um, quantize the system additionally. You, you, there are additional allowed energy levels where the electrons can sit. But they have a lot of room in them. There's a huge degeneracy. You can have many electrons sat in those. And you can understand the uh, quantum Hall effect by effectively a space filling argument. And the argument goes like this. 
that the number of states available in each of those quantum levels when you apply a magnetic field is proportional to magnetic field. So if you set the magnetic field to be an enormous value, you make an awful lot of space in the lowest level and all of the electrons can sit in that lowest level. And you gradually turn down the field and suddenly there's less states in each of the levels. And so at some point you'll exactly fill the first one, you have to jump up into the second one. And so you can see this as a sort of housing crisis for uh, electrons that, that um, there are only so many states available and you have to accommodate them somehow. So what happens is if we apply a, a magnetic field that's very, very large, we make huge amounts of uh, space in the lowest energy level, all of the electrons can be accommodated and that's um, why we sit in this region up here. And then once we get to this point where we've turned down the magnetic field to such an extent we've got to this point here, we've just got exactly the same number of electrons as there are states in the lowest level. And we turn it down further and suddenly some of those electrons have to hop up into the next um, energy level and you end up in this state down here. And then you get subsequently more and more of these staircases as you uh, decrease the field. So that's the integer quantum Hall effect. And again, not particularly mysterious. It did earn Klaus von Klitzing a Nobel Prize, and it's full of very interesting physics. What happens now if we uh, increase the field even further? So this is a different material, so none of the numbers match up, but you can see this was the number one state we talked about before. You can see in even purer samples where you increase the field even higher at even lower temperatures, suddenly you get new steps in the um, Hall effect. You can see there's one at a third filling or a two fifths filling, lots of different fractions. They look like rational fractions, usually with odd denominators, though not always. And this is the fractional quantum Hall effect. And the explanation for this is completely different. So let's have a look at this. What are the properties? Well, if we let's look at a particular value for the sake of argument, let's put our magnetic field up to here. So we're at this level where exactly one third of the uh, uh, states are filled. Okay, so we'll sit up here and ask what the properties of this phase of matter are. Well, the first is that it's incompressible. It feels very rigid. If we try and squeeze this state of matter, it doesn't give at all. It feels more rigid than a solid almost. So we try and squeeze the electrons. They don't, they don't do much. And this rigidity tells us that there's some sort of order by, by Philip Anderson's scheme that we saw before. Probably the most remarkable thing is if we put a little bit of energy into this system and ask what the excitations do, we find that we get excitations which have a fraction of an electronic charge. So in the state that we're in, the one third state, the electrons carry one third of an electronic charge, something that we were told was impossible when we were at school. We were told that an electron charge was the smallest amount of charge that you could move around a system. So not only do we have this fraction of a charge, but these new excitations are neither bosons or fermions. They seem to have new statistics. So again, we've got these new excitations that seem very, very novel. The so we've got new excitations, we've got new properties, new rigidity. It looks like we've got one of a standard bit of ordered matter, albeit with very remarkable properties, but there's no change in symmetry. The electronic gas with a high magnetic field has effectively the same symmetry at any value of non-zero field. And so the symmetry is, is always the same. There's nothing special about a broken symmetry that we end up in to get the fractional quantum Hall effect. And each of those steps looks a little bit like a different phase of matter. I won't dwell on that. I'll always talk about the one third step. So it's quite a remarkable phase of matter, this. And you can um, see that there's lots of scope for talking about emergence. There's emergent properties, there's emergent excitations. Now, Robert Laughlin, who I showed you in this uh, slide before, won his Nobel Prize for giving an explanation by writing down a wave function that describes the system. It's a wave function that describes the whole electronic gas, the whole of the system. The way to understand this is to think very semi-classically. So this can't be the whole um, explanation, but it gives us an idea at least. What do electrons want to do in, in large magnetic fields? Well, they under, undergo sort of cyclotron motion in the plane. And because they're quantum mechanical or semi-classical, at least in this explanation, they have to hop around. They can't move in uh, continuous trajectories. And there's lots of other electrons around, so they have to hop past each other. And electrons are fermions, so they have to make odd numbers of hops. And so you can see that this state of matter must, at least at a semi-classical level, include a very correlated dance of all of the electrons around each other, a very dynamic dance of electrons. And that pattern of dancing electrons must, in some sense, encode the order. 
And that was Laughlin's um, argument. His background was in um, computational and numerical uh, modeling. And so he wrote down a trial wave function that he felt had all of those um, properties. And the intention would it would be a variational wave function that he could then play with. But it turned out remarkably accurately to describe uh, these systems. So that's, that's one way of explaining it. But actually, if you look even closer, the order itself is rather different to symmetry breaking order. The order is topological. And so by topology in this sense, I'm talking about the overall shapes of objects and spaces. So the classic example is to look at this coffee cup, which has this hole in it. And the topologist is allowed to mold these objects around because the topologist cares about shapes. They don't care about the distance between points or the angles between them. So you can mold this coffee cup around and you end up molding it um, subject to the rules that you can't puncture new holes in it or heal up the holes that are already there, you can turn this coffee cup into a donut and the topologist will treat those two um, objects as, as uh, effectively the same or equivalent. Now the geometer won't, uh, from the point of view of geometry, the study of angles and distances, they're completely different, but it's topology that describes these states of matter and not geometry. And topology will arise in two places in this sort of physics. The first is in describing the excitation, and the second is in describing the theories. So in describing the excitation, the idea here is that in order to work out what statistics an object has in physics, we usually play the game where we talk about taking two identical electrons or two identical quantum particles and swapping them. We exchange them in space and we say, well, we can't tell the difference that we've done that. And that puts constraints on the sorts of wave functions we're allowed. And we can argue that there are bosons or fermions from those sorts of arguments. Well, in two dimensions, you have to be very careful because you can't just make an electron disappear and reappear somewhere else. It has to move in the two dimensional plane. And so you have to keep an eye on the exact paths that those particles take. And so in the two dimensional plane, it matters whether you just swap two electrons, as I've shown in panel C here, or they wind around each other, as I've shown in panel D. And the consequence of this is that actually we don't just have bosons or fermions in two dimensional space, we're allowed effectively lots of other um, different sorts of statistics. And so the excitations in two dimensions are known as anions. They can have any statistics effectively subject to a few constraints. So topology describes these um, paths in terms of the number of times they wind around each other. And this sort of winding of paths in space is something we'll return to. The other place topology enters in the description of um, the fractional quantum Hall effect is in the theories. So most theories know about lengths and distances because they combine vectors together and they combine them with an object that we call the metric that is effectively a big bag of um, rulers and clocks and um, protractors because it you, allows one to work out the lengths of vectors. So theories that rely on a metric are standard theories, but a topological theory doesn't mention the metric. What happens is it combines vectors in different ways, but it doesn't do it in such a way that um, it gives you their lengths and things like that. So it doesn't feature the metric. It doesn't know about clocks and rulers. So how do we explain the fractional quantum Hall effect? Well, here, here are two ways. The first is a field theoretical way, uh, and you describe it with what's called the Chern-Simons theory, theory. And if you've never seen this before, it's just there for uh, decoration. The important fact about it is that it's a topological theory. It's a theory that doesn't know about the uh, metric. It only cares about the overall shape of the space in which you're describing things. It's based on a new field, a um, gauge field, and you could call that field emergent because it only appears in these um, fractional quantum Hall type fluids. And what that field does in your theory is it attaches its flux to the excitations and that, um, turns out to give you a way of, of uh, understanding or computing what goes on in this system. And using this sort of theory, you can explain the positions of the Hall plateau, the um, form of the graph that we saw before. You can um, predict the fractional excitations. And it relies on the accountancy of it, relies on there being electrons in this system. Uh, perhaps the easier way to understand it is by thinking about entanglement and quantum entanglement. So often in quantum mechanics, we think about the wave functions of objects being entangled. These topological states of matter, things like the fractional quantum Hall effect, have a special sort of entanglement that the entanglement is very long range. So this has a number of technical implications, but we can just think of it in terms of the uh, entanglements in a topologically ordered system basically feel out the whole of the system and can't be removed 
locally by transforming the wave functions around. So whichever way you understand the fractal quantum Hall effect, it has a sort of whole systemness to it, either through a topological theory that knows about the overall shape of the space by these long range quantum entanglements. So there's a sort of holistic whole system property that comes from these um, interactions in the fractal quantum Hall effect. The state has nothing to do with symmetry breaking. The order here is quite different. You might say, well, can I just calculate this in, uh, by writing down a Hamiltonian? Well, not for a topological theory. If you, because it doesn't feature the uh, metric, if you try and derive a Hamiltonian from the um, Lagrangian that we wrote down before, uh, it turns out you can't do it, and you get an enormous degeneracy in the ground state. So this is, there are in principle ways why a simple reductive way of writing down a theory and computing won't work in these cases. And hopefully I've given you a few reasons to um, consider that this might be a candidate for an emergent um, set of emergent phenomena in that there are new excitations, new properties, those sorts of things. So that's a roundup of the quantum Hall effect. And using that, we can then build on that and ask, well, that's a very, some might say very obscure part of the piece of condensed matter physics. It occurs at very low temperatures, at very high magnetic fields. And when I showed this to a philosopher, they said, well, that's all very well. I always thought if there was going to be a, a good putative case of emergence, it would probably be in something very quantum mechanical and very obscure. Well, it might come as a surprise then that we see very similar structures in classical uh, physics. Why might we see any similar structures in classical and quantum physics at all? Well, one place to look might be the Witt rotations. This is uh, Giancarlo Witt here who noticed that in quantum mechanics, wave functions, they time evolve with the sorts of phase factors that follow um, this imaginary time, so I, E, the energy, T upon H bar. You see these factors all of the time. And if you transform these factors into the form shown on the right, one divided by temperature, effectively, you get lots of equations of classical physics because that gives you the Boltzmann factor. And of course, what that requires mathematically is not just a substitution, it's a rotation. And so this is known as the Witt rotation. And there's something perhaps slightly mysterious, or many writers have said that it's very mysterious, that links many of these quantum mechanical um, equations to the equations of classical physics, the statistical um, equations of thermal physics. And this motivated many people, particularly onwards from the 1960s, who'd been involved in condensed matter physics and quantum mechanics to look to cases where you could use field theory to describe soft matter. So this was particularly the case for Pierre de Gênes, who wrote a very beautiful book on superconductors, who then went on to win a Nobel Prize effectively for understanding soft matter. So um, uh, by which I mean classical physics, statistical physics of things like long flexible chains. So polymers that I'll describe um, in this part of the talk. It's an uh, area of physics that also encompasses the study of things like liquid crystals and glasses, and these remain very poorly understood um, in general. Well, here are some examples of polymers, long flexible chains of plasticky material, and there are lots of different sorts of polymers. There's the, um, the sort of uh, spaghetti-like matter you probably imagine of long flexible chains that are intertwined, and there's probably less um, less familiar versions that I'm going to get onto very shortly. So the microscopic physics of all of these different sorts of polymers differs very little. They just look like little beads of monomers, little molecules effectively. But overall, the whole systemness, the whole system properties, the long range properties vary rather a lot. Here are some examples of why we might look uh, to this sort of physics that, and there might be interesting long range or topological sorts of um, uh, physics going on here. So if we look at the very entangled spaghetti-like matter made of one-dimensional strings that can't cross, well, the mean square end-to-end -end distance of one of those strings, that varies with n, the number of um, monomers in a chain, and then the volume of those things, that goes as n to the three halves. And then if you ask, well, how many other chains sit within the volume occupied by a single chain, well, you divide that by n and you get a number that varies as n to the half. If you make n very large, because these things are made from an absolutely enormous number of monomers, because they're macroscopic bits of matter, that number diverges. So in its single chain, will interact with a huge number of other chains um, that are all basically entangled with it. And so to understand that, we take a single chain and we imagine the whole of the rest of the system forming a tube around it that provides a set of constraints to how that single um, uh, polymer can, uh, can undergo its dynamics. 
And so you can see immediately there might be ways to understand these systems with these sorts of topological arguments. And it turns out that this isn't a good place to look for these sorts of arguments because this, um, this tube that surrounds the polymer chain, it's temporary and topologically it's not very well defined. So we can look further, we can, instead of looking at these chains, why don't we look at rings? And so imagine uh, a set of rings, how do we understand those? Well, they're chains with no free ends, so we join those together. And they look a little bit like the sorts of things we might understand with things that are uh, joined up or knotted. And we understand them with the same sorts of variables, the number of times you wrap a chain around another one, these sorts of topological uh, variables we had before. And so you can see that in these examples of rings, there might be a place where we could use these same sorts of topological arguments. Chemically, you make these things. You, you For example, if you want to make a nice dense set of um, rings that are well entangled, you take a set of chains and you put them through a chemical process of cyclization, and so they become rings afterwards, and that makes a very complicated topological state of lots of um, rings intertwining lots of other rings. And those are characterized by a set of numbers, winding numbers, that tell you effectively how many times you've wrapped one chain around another one. And again, this looks slightly like the case we had before of thinking about particles wrapping around each other when we exchange them and we try to understand their statistics. So this, is, this might be one place to look for these sorts of topological arguments. Well, again, these topological variables, they are the things that characterize these sorts of systems. Um, they describe the whole system evolution and macroscopically, these very entangled chains, they look quite solid even though the um, over small distances, those uh, monomers, they can move around as if they're fairly free. So again, this might be one place to look, but actually it turns out that this is far too complicated for us. Let's look at the simplest possible case of rings. Let's look at a set of rings that don't actually uh, wind around any of the other rings. So the one you might call topologically trivial. So this case on the right, part D here. So we'll make a very dilute solution of these, um, of these chains and we'll cyclize them. And so a chain basically never sees another chain. We've made them so dilute that we make a set of rings that don't link any other rings. So all of the winding numbers are set to zero. Every single ring just wraps around and never sees another one. Okay, so we've, we've done this and then we'll just remove all of the solvent and the stuff will just collapse now. And there's an enormous pressure on this stuff. And what it wants to do is turn into that highly entangled um, matter that we saw before, but it can't because we've set those topological variables, we've set those um, rings um, to be zero for all time. And so there's a bit of a contradiction here. And what happens is that this, this system of rings collapses down at all length scales down to uh, a very short distance. And it makes this configuration. This is often called a Russian doll configuration or a collapsed globule state. It's all of the chains turned, uh, all of the rings turned down to have um, not be interlinked, but somehow have to get as close as possible uh, to each other. And actually this remains liquid-like because nothing's entangled with anything else. All of these chains can just slip over all of the other chains and they can, they can flow around. So it ve it's very, very dense matter, but it's locally mobile and like a, um, like a liquid. So it's this state of matter that looks a lot like the fractional quantum Hall fluid. And you might immediately ask, well, how? Because it looks so different. And there are lots of obvious contrasts. So the fractional quantum Hall system is built from electrons. Those are the things really of, of interest here. The polymer system is built from these flexible rings. So immediately they look very different. The fractional quantum Hall state, we argued, was this dynamic state of electrons hopping around. These polymer states we're interested in are effectively static. So you know the, the polymer states themselves are made from um, these polymer rings sort of collapse down into some, uh, some final configuration. We argued that there's order in the fractional quantum Hall state because the electron gas itself is incompressible, you can't squeeze it. The polymer rings, they, they're a sort of liquid-like state and you can stir those and move them around and compress them. So on the face of it, they are quite different systems, but they turn out to be remarkably closely linked. And in particular, both can be described by the Schoen-Simons theory, a topological theory. And both have these decisive um, topological features because whole system interactions are the things that are really important for both cases. So let's unpick this a little bit more. So remember the um, Chern-Simons theory, so the theory that described the fractional quantum Hall fluid, it was this theory that contained no mention of the uh, metric in the important parts of the theory, uh, so it was a topological one, and it was based on 
a field, a new emergent field that um, tied its flux to the excitations in the fractional quantum ball fluid. So how on earth might it um, apply to this system of polymer rings? Well, quite remarkably, the excitations in the fractional quantum Hall effect we saw are anions. And we can also understand the dynamics of the polymer or the excitations of the polymer using the same arguments based on these anions. And here's mathematically at least how it works. In the fractional quantum Hall effect, we had electrons confined to a two-dimensional plane or excitations confined to a two-dimensional plane. And we can make this uh, equivalent at least to three dimensional space and a polymer having a uh, shape in a three dimensional space by treating the third dimension that the electron moves in as time. So this is the picture to have. So we have our electron that moves in two spatial dimensions and in one time dimension. And we can interpret that in terms of the polymer as this literally being the, um, uh, the, the polymer molecule itself. Okay, and once you do that, then the xy coordinates of a polymer, they act like a quantum particle at one instant of time. And then you've got a formal equivalence between the polymer system and the um, fractional quantum hall system. And then a Chern Simons theory describes this. You can use the Chern Simons fields, they attach themselves to the velocity of the rings uh, coordinates. And then a piece of polymer chain effectively attaches itself to the flux of that Chern Simons uh, field. And you can then describe the dynamics of the polymer state in terms of the um, uh, physics of the fractional quantum hall effect. So it's quite a remarkable. Thing, but it turns out to work very well. Uh, may I ask so, a question? Please, yep. Yeah. So, but then you're saying, so then you're going to have to go back in time somehow to create rings or not? That's right. So globally, you will do. So locally, though, when you uh, you look at a particular instant in time, you've just got a piece of uh, ring at some point. So you, you will have to do that eventually. But uh, for the most part, that's not too serious a consideration. They're very lo long rings. OK. Uh, can I ask a question? Um... It, 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 the Lagrangian is the same? Like you can use the same? Uh, you, the Chern Simons term is the same. The, yeah. the uh, way you couple it is ever so slightly different. You, in the uh, fractional quantum Hall effect, you couple it literally to the electromagnetic field because right. you're dealing with electrons. Uh, that's not the case in the polymer field. It's, it's, the structure is ever so slightly different, but overall it's the same Chern Simons term. And mathematically, what the Chern Simons term does, it doesn't have any dynamics of its own. It sets a it sets up a system of topological constraints, mm -hmm. and they, they can they then um, decide the dynamics of the of the system. Okay, okay. So the main message here is that there's this um, uh, equivalence here, and again, perhaps the classical system isn't so interesting in terms of you know it doesn't have that very um, uh, easily understood sense of there being new excitations, but formally it's at least an intriguing um, place to look for an equivalence. So how do we understand this in terms of emergence? So I'm going to spend the last uh, section of the talk just trying to unpick a little bit what's special about the fractional quantum Hall effect and what does the um, Chern-Simons theory and what does the fact that you can use it to describe a classical system what does that tell us about what's special about the fractional quantum Hall effect and the possibility of emergence? Well, there's a number of ways you might describe um, a system as having either emergent properties or being emergent in some sense. There might be some failure in your um, method of explaining it, some failure of explanatory reduction. You, you can't compute um, from the lowest level up to the highest level. There might be new entities. So for example, the um, excitations I've mentioned several times. There might be uh, properties of the whole system uh, that are novel, that appear when the system orders in particular configurations. Or there might be uh, something that tells us that the whole of the system can no longer be described from the parts. And I'm going to argue that it's this sort of um, failure to describe the whole system in terms of its parts as where we should possibly look for uh, the emergence in the fractional quantum Hall effect. So looking at these very briefly one by one, I'm, I'll skip over explanatory reduction because the fractional quantum Hall effect probably has this feature. So I've mentioned that it's very difficult to deal with a Hamiltonian description of the fractional quantum Hall effect. If you write down um, the equations of motion for an electron gas and start perturbing them, you'll get the wrong answer because you end up in a rather different Hilbert space to the one you end up with. So there's 
the fractal quantum Hall effect arguably has this feature. It's very, very difficult to start from nothing or start from first principles and get very far towards explaining it. But if you accept that, then you'll accept that it's prob this is a probably widespread problem. In, there's many, many examples in physics where it's difficult and there might be, in principle, um, uh, reasons to believe you, m you might be, uh, you, um, but there might be barriers to you uh, describing a system from first principles. So again, this, this will depend on your opinion of how nature works. And so we'll, we'll skip over this one because it, it, it could be applied to anything. You could, probably the most attractive way to um, understand emergence is in terms of new emergent particles. So uh, in condensed matter generally, when you get new phases of matter, you tend to get new quasi particles. And if you regard those realistically, as many people do, then um, they, they, appear, they appear quite generally and they appear in things like metals in terms of particles like electrons effectively dressed with fluctuations. They appear in terms of collective excitations, things like phonons, lattice vibrations, things like magnons, spin waves in magnets. Um, again, they uh, occur all over the place. So again, I, one, one can describe emergence in these senses, but I don't think this gets to the bottom of what's interesting about the fractal quantum Hall case. In particular, there are reasons to be very cautious in these topological cases, and that's because um, uh, anions can have different properties to other sorts of quasi particles. In particular, because there's the possibility of multiple sorts of anion, multiple sorts of statistics for the particles that uh, appear, they can be fused and they combine their quantum numbers in ways that uh, wouldn't be the case for a different phase of matter. So I think one would need to be very cautious because potentially any argument you come up with that was general might be undermined in these topological cases. So this probably isn't a safe place to start. You might look at the novelty of um, systemic properties, and this is probably what people like Philip Anderson and people working within condensed matter have in mind when they think about emergence in condensed matter. Uh, so things like um, the rigidity that we've mentioned before. And this has been discussed a lot, uh, and uh, one of the main uh, difficulties in this debate is, is there's a confusion between uh, what one means if one talks about emergence, are we just talking about something ontological, are we talking about something epistemic, it's, it's very difficult to um, untangle those. Again, but this might be a good way forward, this would seem, this is the way that most people would, would argue, I think. What I'm going to try and do is just take a slightly different route and just try and say that there's something special about these topological phases, the quantum Hall case and the collapsed globule polymer case, because they rely on whole system interactions. And this might be one place to at least understand what's special or what might be especially emergent in the case of the um, fractional quantum Hall state, for example. And it's this idea of whole system properties, that the fractional quantum Hall quasi-particles can't be understood just as particles. They are collective excitations of the whole of the system. The topological nature of the Chern-Simons field, they rely on the whole system interactions, the whole knowledge of the whole system. Or you can think in the fractional quantum Hall case <clears throat> in our cartoon picture of long range entanglements as these being long range feeling out the whole system. So this, this whole systemness, I think, is what I'm going to argue is special about the fractional quantum Hall case. Now, originally, when we thought about the fractional quantum Hall case, we came up with an argument to try and understand this. We went back to Paul Humphrey's um, ideas about fusion, that um, what Humphrey's was suggesting was that you can see a, a sort of failure of myriological supervenience, so failure of the whole system being described in terms of the behavior of the parts. And that's because Humphrey's argues that when you get emergence, what happens is the things at the bottom, the small things, they tend to fuse their properties in some sense. And though the entities remain, the properties basically disappear. It's no longer possible to talk about the properties coherently of the lower level stuff. They get fused in making the what happens at the higher level. And so the higher level can't rely on the stuff at the lower level anymore because the properties at the lower level have in some sense disappeared. So that was Paul Humphrey's arguments for, um, from 20 years ago now. And we thought, well, maybe there's, there was something to this because in quantum mechanical cases, people like Paul Teller had argued that, well, quantum entanglement's quite special because properties behave very in a particular way in um, uh, entangled system. 
they tend to become relational. They're properties that don't that are sort of shared by a number of um, uh, number of entities. You can imagine spins being entangled in the quantum case, for example. <clears throat> And so what we suggested originally in terms of the practical quantum Hall effect is you could come up with a sort of idea where fusion might give you something like um, uh, emergence, but it doesn't work by properties disappearing. It works by property, by quantum entanglement, turning uh, non-relational properties like the charges on individual electrons into inherently relational ones. So the charge now is something that's shared by the whole system. Okay, so the basal properties, they're still there. We still have charges in the system, but they're now shared in some sense. So we, we wondered if this was some way that you could understand how these whole system um, type, uh, uh, type pieces of matter, how those would give you something um, emergent. Well, you know, uh, uh, you can try and think of examples that are specific to the um, fractional quantum Hall fluid. So again, I mentioned the electron charge and then what happens is we imagine the electrons condensing into a fractional quantum Hall state. And then what we have is the whole system is very entangled. And so when you put in a little bit of energy, a fraction of a charge is an expression of an excitation of the whole system. And that um, charge no longer belongs to any particular electron. It's shared by the whole system. And how can it belong to a particular electron because there's only a fraction of it. And so the electron has in a sense, given up its charge to all the entanglement. So this was the sort of argument that we came up with. Now, I think what the ring polymer... Um, so, sorry, can I ask you a question? Uh, oh, please do. Uh, but but how, how does that point of view differ from your, uh, you know, pr proposition two, in which you get new properties? Again, it, it probably doesn't. Proposition two is probably okay. Um, okay. I think it, what it doesn't, what Proposition 2 doesn't necessarily do is spell out just uh, anything about the whole systemness. Hmm. Okay, so if one is looking for why is the fractional quantum Hall effect a more extreme example, I think one would look to the sort of whole systemness and the, the sort of topological nature. So that, but, but yeah, it's probably compatible with, with uh, number two. Okay. Okay, but I think what, if one wants to go down that route, what the ring polymer, um, argument teaches us is that, well, maybe entanglement isn't the way to understand all of these systems, at least. It might be a, a part of how one wants to explain the fractional quantum Hall case, but because we've got a, a classical system in, um, which has very, very similar um, sort of explanation behind it, the quantum entanglements possibly aren't the thing that's special. Because in the ring polymer, we don't have quantum entanglements in the same sense. So there's no loss of um, something like the charge in the same sense that we had before. What we do have, however, are a change in which properties determine which other properties. That the um, things that constrain the motion of the polymer case are these topological variables. So it's probably a mistake to uh, and try and explain these systems in terms of quantum entanglement. That's probably not the thing that's special probably the topological variables themselves are the things to concentrate on. So again, the, you can argue these things in terms of um, these topological variables being a sort of inherently relational thing. They belong to the whole system in a sense. They depend on the global state of the system. So again, we wouldn't argue we have uh, this sort of loss of supervenience in the same sense. Uh, we can do lots of things in terms of the microscopic variables. For example, we can describe the stress of the system, but these topological variables are special and they are needed to understand the microscopic. So let's just try and unpick this very briefly in the very final part. So again, this is what I've already said. It's a mistake to think entanglement is necessarily the special thing. What we're going to concentrate on are, um, what are the important properties? Are they the topological ones? Well, is what I'm describing a form of top-down causation. So one way of um, thinking about top-down causation is what uh, George Ellis um, says in some of his papers. So he defines at least one sort of top-down causation as a sort of higher level variables having some sort of lower level causal power over the dynamics. Well, you might want to go down this, um, uh, this route. Certainly you can identify lots of things that these sorts of systems, systems like the polymers have, which would fit into this sort of system. So there's lots of lower level variables that correspond to the same high level structure. So you set your topological variables at the top. And there's lots of configurations that are consistent with those. 
change those higher level variables, change those topological uh, properties, and you change the sorts of things you're allowed at the lower level. And there's a certain sort of indeterminacy at the lower level. So you could talk in terms of top-down causation. I'm never sure about this. I'm not sure I understand what top-down causation is. I'm not sure I understand that it's particularly coherent. But again, this might be one way of understanding this sort of thing. But could you argue the other way? Are, are these topological variables actually special at all? Can you simply express them in terms of the microscopic ones? You know, for example, the um, you know we talk about these winding numbers. Well, we know what the microscopic variables are. They're bits of monomers. We can trace out the path of a um, a polymer. You know, can we can we just start at the bottom and work all of this stuff up? And we sort of tell ourselves we can often, but a lot of those arguments we use to tell ourselves we can have a formal status, and it's possibly only a formal status. So, for example, when you try and do computations, there's a formal requirement to have a cutoff in your field theories, and you always have to add those topological properties in as extra bits of information. So that's if you're doing field theory. If you're um, looking at the chemistry of these materials, you need to know the chemical history, and the chemical history is a proxy for the topological information. That topical, it, to, topological information is extra information that always seems to be added by hand. And again, if you're doing computer simulations, you're doing them on a lattice, again, you need to put in by hand lots of global constraints, global crossing numbers when you do these sorts of polymer computations. So there are reasons to believe that, again, it's always possible that if you know everything about the lower level, you can keep computing and get the stuff at the higher level and might be able to work out things without these topological variables. But again, I think there are reasons to believe at least um, provisionally the, the topological variables might be extra bits of information. They might they might be emergent. Yeah, but but then okay. but then it sounds like it's difficult to go away from the top down causation. If you, I think that's yeah. I think that's a problem. Um, okay. So I'm almost at the end now. So we'll, we can discuss this. Um, okay. okay. In the quick questions. This is my last slide. Okay. So uh, the so what I've shown you is two examples of condensed matter. I've shown you the fractional quantum hall effect um, and the topological case. And what I've argued is what I think special here in some sense are these topological variables, because I think these are decisive in um, telling us what's special about these. Both of them rely on high level variables and what they do is provide constraints. They constrain the lower level configurations. And again, as uh, just as you say, <coughs> excuse me, that might be something that you think about in terms of top down causation. And you could characterize this as a failure of the top level being determined by the lower level. Um, but I think, I mean, what I think the main point I'd like to make here is that many people now have talked about the fractional quantum Hall fluid and come up with lots of different ways to try and understand if this is a good case to look for emergence. But I think what the ring polymer case does is show us that we shouldn't necessarily just be looking at these very quantum mechanical cases. Actually, there's an awful lot in good old fashioned classical physics, the physics of statistics, where we see those structures mirrored. And that might be a good place to look for these sorts of correspondences. So I've spoken for quite long enough and I'm losing my voice now. So I'll stop there and thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for this uh, really clear and uh, amazing talk. Um, we have uh, definitely time for some questions. So if anyone would like to ask something, please, uh, you can just unmute yourselves. Uh, well, doesn't look like. I have a, uh, maybe a yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, not not silly, but um, so it seems that you're sort of saying, or if I understand the sentiment correctly, you're sort of saying the things people call emergent are maybe too, too sort of basic, and you actually want to to look for something more special. Uh, and and you say this is because you keep saying a, a candidate for emergent phenomenon. Or, yeah, so you, you want, yeah, you, you don't seem to be happy with this other definition of emergent. You want something more special. 
Is that, yeah, is I that think that, that was the that was the sort of <clears throat> excuse me the strategy behind this project. That lots of people will, uh, you know, there are lots of good examples of things that might be emergent, but the same arguments are always applied to them. So we were asked, you know, and people often say, well, is there anything stronger? Can you find a stronger form of emergence? And, you know, there's even, there's the well-known debate now between weak and strong emergence. And again, it's quite difficult to unpick exactly what people mean. But, um, you know, you could go down the route of saying, is there something that's, you know, the strongest form of emergence? possible and I think that's what motivated us to try and look for something that was a bit different and maybe had some extra features where you know from this sort of extreme case would that teach us anything yeah. so I don't have anything against these other cases you know it may be that um, any ordered phase of matter has properties that are, uh, are well understood as being emergent and that's a good way of looking at it for many reasons but I think the fractional quantum hall fluid shows something extra to that and you know that uh, there might be something we can learn about those other cases by looking at these more extreme cases. So, so maybe as a follow-up, if I may, uh, Jay. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, I'm 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 new to the whole philosophy of emergence. So I'm still figuring it out. But as I understand it, you've got the level of the theories, and you can speak about emergence on the level of the theories, which is, if I understood correctly, what you're doing here. But then you have, of course, also emergence on the level of phys physical matter, which, mm -hmm. is, which also seems to be happening here. But who's to say that there is not some other theory um, that is able to explain? So, so you've used this um, top-down causality or causation or, um, um, yeah, you call it supervening? Yeah, supervenience. Yeah. yeah. Um, so who's to say that there is not some other theory that is able to describe it as the sum of its parts? Yeah, so uh, there is, of course, you're quite right, no way of, of saying that, that that's not the case. Um, you, know, you know, that's that's always an argument we're open to. I think the main thing, the only thing we can really do <clears throat> is point to uh, possible barriers to those existing. So, for example, in the topological case, the fact that it's you can um, it's very difficult to write down a Hamiltonian description of any of these things because formally speaking you know you try and work out how many states are in the ground state and you get you can't work out the ground state degeneracy it looks to be enormous you need to look at the overall shape of the manifold in order to understand these theories you know there, there are lots of these things you can point to that look like barriers to actually being able to count carry out those sorts of computations you're quite right though that there's nothing I can say that um, uh, will prevent there possibly being some method that would would circumvent all of these. So yeah, I don't have a don't have a good answer to that. Uh, can I ask you a question? So um, so in in this sort of emergence literature, there's there's a lot of discussion about you know how how to go from the microscopic to the macroscopic, and you know how to take the standard model and you know somehow model a piece of metal, and and there is a, a lot of discussion about it. Um, uh, of how to define the system properly and a lot of it is about you know boundary conditions mm -hmm. maybe there is something i have to sort of put the standard model in the box and i have to put the right environment that would model the metal and and the question is should i see the topology as a boundary condition that then i put the system in somehow is that is that would that be a way of seeing it? Is, I guess I guess I'm saying it, it, should it be a boundary condition or is it really an emergent thing that I don't know where it comes from? Yeah. I, okay, I think that's a very good point. Yeah. I don't have a good answer to that. I think you could talk about them being boundary conditions. They they are extra information. Right. Whether they're a physical boundary in the same sense that <clears throat> if you are modeling a metal, the edges of the metal are you know like the edges of a box you know, they are quite literally those things the energy increases you know the bands shoot up at the edges because otherwise all the electrons would fall out you know it, it, they are quite literally those things it's more difficult in the top topological sense to say you know that there's some sort of literal correspondence there yeah, yeah I, I i guess maybe a related question to this is I mean, is there an example of any other quantum system or even classical system in which you can take the microscopics and somehow derive the, topolo the topolog topological properties? 
because you're yeah. you're sort of saying I cannot do this kind of in 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 this case, but is there maybe a simpler case? Uh, in which yeah, so, okay, that, that's a good question. I, <clears throat> I'm not convinced that there is. There's there's lots of uh, so not. Uh, I mean, one could derive a property that you could describe in terms of topology because it's difficult to imagine a wave function that doesn't have something about it that you could uh, describe in terms of um, topology, or at least that's what lots of people have said. What I think you find difficulty in doing is find these topologically ordered phases of matter. So there are other examples of these from physics, the so-called spin liquids, for example. So these are magnets that never magnetically order, that have huge ground state degeneracies, um, that are thought to be realized in a small number of materials, so that's um, still slightly controversial. Those sorts of phases of matter, I think everyone does have uh, a problem in arguing, can one calculate? And people have claimed, well, there, there is one way of understanding these things, the so-called um, uh, uh, sort of fractionalized quasi-particle view of, of how these work. And people have pointed out that actually those arguments don't really work technically, that you're always sneaking in information about the whole system and that there's no way of doing that that's really bottom up. Okay, so this is something that people have thought about, but I'm, I'm, I think because you're dealing with topological order, which is more, uh, which is uh, something I think more special than there just being some topological constraints. I think it's a more extreme um, demand. Well, let's say the, the simple non strongly correlated topological insulators, right? The stuff where you can do band inversion in your density functional theory computer and you can uh -huh. have, uh, that you have an inverted gap and this, this, then this, yeah, I think that's a good non point. Reality yeah. rolls out of that. I mean, whether you consider that topologi topologically ordered or not, I don't know. So, but okay, but the, the quantum hole, right? The the, the plateau insulated transition and the plateau plateau transitions in the regular quantum hole, those are topological ordered systems. Okay, so I think I think if you, yeah, I, I think it would depend on how you define topological order. If you do it in the way that Zhao Gang Wen does, in terms of these long range entanglements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then there is a difference but if you don't if you're if you're more permissive than that i think you're quite right you could you could go down that route uh, I, yeah go yeah, ahead can i ask a question about um a bit more about the physics in in the classical setting so you said okay it's, you can describe these ring polymers um using chern simons theory and you can also get anions if you consider time as the third dimension. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, can you just explain again how 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 you get these anions? Because I only understand anions in sort of a, a quantum mechanical context where yeah you can exchange two particles and you get a phase. Um, and I don't I don't see where that comes from in in a classical setting or is it just by analogy in the, in it, the mathematics? Really it's just by analogy yeah no you're quite right it is it is by analogy there isn't some secret extra bit of physics it's it's a copy of the structure of the theory more than it is okay. uh, more than that the, there's some literal new piece of physics in there so from that from that point of view it's not tremendously interesting physically okay yeah thanks i was uh, just confused about that Uh, Could you uh, explain yeah. a bit more this uh, exactly what this Chern Simons field does for you for these ring polymers? I'm not sure I. So we have a bunch of ring polymers. They're not supposed to not are linked. Mm -hmm. We look at the three dimensional configuration. We interpret one direction as, as time somehow. Uh, and now we write down some classical field theory that has a Chern Simons gauge field in it. Yeah. Exactly. Does that Chern Simons gauge field accomplish in this particular setting? So again, again, all a Chern Simons theory ever does is provide a set of constraints on the dynamics of of the of another field that you couple to it, and the field. So does it prevent the linking of the polymers, or does it? That, that's always prevented. Yeah, that pre that's prevented by hand from outside. Okay, so so yeah, that that must that will never occur. They'll never change that topology. And what constraint does the Simon's theory impose on top of the non-linking on the on this polymer configuration? So it provides a set of constraints to the velocity field of the um, of the monomers. 
So there are certain, um, certain things the velocity field can and can't do when it's coupled to the Chern-Simons um, theory. So that's where the constraints come in. So in the same way that in the fractional quantum hall case, the um, Chern-Simons theory provides a set of constraints on the directions of the electromagnetic field. And that, that's what gives you the Hall effect, the fact that the E and B fields are constrained in a particular way. It's the velocity field of the, um, of the polymers that, that is the thing you constrain. So it can take certain configurations and not other ones. So it's a mathematical rewriting of uh, microscopically well understood constraint. Uh, yes, you could, you could, um, yeah, you could characterize it like that. I think. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm. I can ask you a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So in your different, I guess it's to uh, come back to the question of the uh, gens, on you know uh, the fact you were try trying to find a different types of emergence have people tried to classify uh you know what what which kind of emergence like you you were talking about weak and strong emergence like is there an endeavor to i understand your your, your research as an endeavor to do that but is there is it you know uh, what what is the status of, of this classification is there so i think people have tried uh, i mean certainly there have been some some attempts um so people have tried to characterize emergence in terms of uh, weak and strong, with weak being things like the flocking of birds and strong being something stronger, you know, uh, and then then in the other axis, they've tried to um, characterize it in terms of epistemolo epistemology, the failure of the explanation and the literal ontology of there being new emergent things. And that great gives you a sort of four four boxes you can put your emergent properties into but it's never really I, I think people have then argued that that might not be a good way of understanding it is you know uh, is there because what people would then like to identify is that is there an ontological strong emergence is there something in the most extreme box and i think that's always where where that sort of project has faltered but this is more or less what you're trying to argue with your case, no? Yeah, <laughs> or, or, you know. <laughs> I, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the question was, you know, it, has that project got any further? And I'm not okay. sure it has. Okay. Well, I mean, I would like to see perhaps, I mean, maybe that's my, my uh, you know, bias towards quantifying things. I would like to see like a table, you know, with yep. <laughs> to, to uh, <laughs> you know, uh, is the, you know, feature one, feature two, and then, okay, I understand. Me too, me too. <laughs> I, I'm not sure anyone's ever, yeah, I'm not sure anyone's done that. I think uh, that there have been people who've tried to sort of classify these things. They've tried lots of different, um, subtly different ways, but I'm not sure I've ever seen that uh, table where things are literally put in the boxes. Okay, so I had I had another question, maybe. Go ahead, yeah. So uh, if I understood correctly, and I might be completely wrong, but the, the idea also in this case of the polymer, uh, the polymer rings, and the, was to use uh, microscopic topological variables as the basis from which you can find an emergent theory. And my question is, uh, it is, I mean, I, I, I understand it conceptually, but it is really hard for me to, to see this at a more technical level, like the topology itself doesn't have dynamics or you embed somehow dynamics into the topology or what is am i missing something it is i think that the way i look at it is is constraints that what topology does is provide a set of constraints so just, just as we mentioned before a churn simons theory isn't a theory that has any dynamics of its own that gauge field doesn't doesn't do a great deal what it does do is constrain the field it's coupled to and that that's what topology does in these cases it um it allows particular configurations and it doesn't allow other ones. So, so the underlying dynamics are the same. It's the, it's the same Hamiltonian, it, if you want to call it. Uh, no. Um, I, mean, I mean, if you look at the fractional quantum Hall case, you, you couple the, so the electromagnetic field is still there and has the same dynamics. So you still have the same terms of the Lagrangian. You've coupled them to a Chern-Simons theory. I see. So you, you did use the analogy of the quantum effect to somewhat describe the dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 